and oh, it's yep. recording. Cool. And we got some folks joining us. Welcome, everyone. Beautiful. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday to you all. And we're just gonna let the lobby fill up with our participants before we get going. Uh, and as the lobby fills up, you'll notice that you all are muted, but feel free to use the chat box to connect and ask questions. Um, and also visit urbangreenlab.org or the Metro Nashville Zero Waste Facebook to learn a little bit more about our program. Uh, if you do head over to urbangreenlab.org or Metro Nashville Zero Waste Facebook, uh, you will notice all of the events that we have scheduled from now until the end of March. Uh, so go ahead and uh, like those, join those event pages, register for those events. Uh, we got some really fun stuff lined up for y'all. Thank you, Nicole. And again, if you are just joining us, we're gonna get started in a couple of minutes uh, and you are all muted, but don't let that slow you down. Feel free to use the chat box to connect and ask questions. And after the presentation, uh, we'll have time for that Q&A with Jen. Yes, we're gonna try and save as much time as I can for, for questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, just in some lighter news, uh, I'm not sure if everyone has been outside today, but the sun is out. Uh, it's a little bit warmer than it has been in the past couple of days. So I encourage everyone to get outside, walk around, get some vitamin D uh, safely, of course. Uh, but that's a little added bonus uh, to the presentation you're all about to hear right now. All right, and for the sake of time, Jen, if it's okay with you, I'm just gonna go ahead and get our introduction going. But um, hello everyone, my name is Patrick King from Urban Green Lab, uh, and I'm here with Jen Harmon from Metro Nashville Public Works. And you are here for the first session of our new series, Sustainable in the City, Thinking Upstream. Uh, this series will feature interviews, presentations, and panel discussions uh, with Nashville's top experts on all areas of waste and sustainability. Uh, and today we'll be hearing from my co-hostess with the mostest, Jenna Harmon, who you all have just met. <laughs> um, a few reminders before we get going. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to Urban Green Lab's YouTube channel, please do so now. Uh, there you'll be able to find all the previous sessions from this series and much, much more. Uh, just search Urban Green Lab on youtube.com and subscribe. Uh, you can like us on social media as, as well. Uh, you can find us uh, on Facebook at Metro Nashville Zero Waste at Urban Green Lab. Um, and if you like both of those pages on Facebook, you'll be able to keep up with all those events. And those events will be on our websites as well. And our website is urbangreenlab.org, uh, as well as Metro Nashville Public Works. Um, and Urban Green Lab is a nonprofit, so if you feel so inclined to support the work that we do, you can make a donation at our website, or you can text 44321, or text Team UGL, all one word, to 44321, uh, and you can get a link sent to your phone. Uh, and with that, and introductions all out of the way, Jen, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. And uh, I am just going to make a note. You probably saw somebody popping in and out of the video. That was uh, my colleague, Sharon Smith. She's part of our, our Zoom hosting. So she might pop in to, to see the presentation. So uh, just ignore her. She'll, she might be there. She might not. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, well, first of all, thank you all so much for being here for our very first Sustainable in the City series presentation. I am super excited uh, that I get to be the, the special expert guest talking today and talking about one of my favorite and perhaps most frustrating topics, uh, all about plastics recycling. So today we're going to talk about Nashville's recycling program. We're going to talk about how plastics get recycled and hopefully I'll be able to provide you some insight on why we only accept bottles, jars, and jugs, and why we should really be thinking upstream 
rather than thinking about recycling to solutions for our plastic waste. All right, so I'm gonna jump in and give you an idea of how this program is going to be built. I've got four little sections we're gonna go over, starting off with just the basics, the 101 of Metro's recycling program and our acceptable plastics. Then we're gonna jump right into the bulk of the presentation, which is gonna be that why question, why only bottles, jars, and jugs? And we're gonna talk about that by looking at the economics and the infrastructure that's required to make what you put in the bin come out the other side as new goods and products. Um, then we're really briefly gonna touch on how recycling has changed, especially in the last couple of years. Um, you know, Talk just very briefly about China and how international bans on plastic recyclables has affected our recycling here regionally, even though we in Nashville and in the Southeast, we aren't necessarily sending our plastic to China. Um, and then also we will talk, all, what's, what's the next step? What do we do now? Where do we go from here? So what plastics can I recycle in Nashville? The 101 of our program. So Metro Nashville, and, and I'm talking Metro Nashville Public Works, we offer curbside and drop-off recycling to provide access to recycling for all residents in Davidson County. Our curbside is offered to residents in what's called the Urban Services District, and that's what's shown in this really ugly puke green color here. Um, and that's around 140,000 households. Um, and we collect about 11,000 or more tons of recycling annually from that program. And then for those that do not have curbside service, we have 10 drop-off locations and we have four convenience centers, all of which are places where residents can drop off their recycling. Uh, and that program collects a little over 6,000 tons of recycling each year. Uh, now these pro uh, programs, they're funded by taxpayer dollars. So they are part of your property taxes, sales taxes um, that, that come to the city through our general fund. Um, there's not a fee for your trash or your recycling collection. Um, and the urban services district, so that area that has the curbside recycling, that urban services district is a higher tax district. So those, those residents, they pay a higher property tax each year, and that's what helps pay for uh, and provides and allows for that access to curbside trash and recycling service because they do pay a little bit more in their taxes. But that's how our collection program is set up. Now in Nashville, we only recycle about 12%. This is kind of the, the harsh reality of our program is that we only recycle about 12% of the waste that we generate here in Nashville. And of that 12%, 46% is not actually recyclable and ends up in the landfill. 46% of what's being put in curbside bins cannot be recycled. And this is triple the US average. And well, we can, we can really do better than that. And that's why, we're, why I'm here talking to you about this today um, and, and why we have uh, increased our education programs as well as here at Public Works. So our recycling program uh, accepts paper and cartons. We accept cardboard. We accept food and drink cans and plastic bottles, jars, and jugs. That's both in curbside and drop-off. At our drop-off locations, we also accept glass. But today we are talking specifically about plastics. So for our acceptable plastics, as I, we've changed this up in the past year to be just bottles, jars, and jugs to really simplify this. And these are all containers. Um, so bottles, jars, and jugs are all containers that have a neck and have a cap. It's kind of a basic definition of this. And it's a great way to know how, whether or not something fits in our program. So a plastic bottle, are things like water bottles, shampoo bottles, um, even a, a, like a little spice, uh, spice bottle as well. Um, so these are things that have kind of that tapered neck, smaller opening with a cap that snaps or screws on. Uh, and then we have our plastic jars. And plastic jars are like mayonnaise jars, peanut butter jars, spice jars, even those large plastic coffee containers. Um, so these are containers that are gonna have a wider neck, but they're still gonna have a neck and it's gonna have a cap on it. Um, and then jugs. So these are things like your milk jugs, your juice jugs, detergent jugs. But again, they have a neck with a cap, they just have a handle. Um, so these are the only plastic items that we accept in our recycling program, bottles, jars, and jugs. It doesn't matter what color they are. It just has to be a bottle, a jar, or a jug. And these containers should be emptied. They should be rinsed. They should be set to dry. And then you put that cap back on and toss it into your recycling. Everything else, leave it out. Plastic bags, bulky plastic garden hoses. If it does not fit in the category of a bottle, a jar, or a jug, if you're asking yourself, what is this item? Is it, it's a tub. 
It's not a bottle jar or jug, so it does not go in our program. Um, so if it's not a bottle jar or jug, leave it out of your recycling bin. Um, now I get the question, we, and we got a lot of questions before this presentation about the numbers. What numbers can I recycle? Can I recycle one, number two, what about three through seven? I want you to untrain yourself to see these numbers or symbols as a symbol of recyclability, because these numbers do not mean that something is recyclable. And for most everyone, they are just confusing. I can say with certainty that all number three through number seven plastics are not recyclable here in Nashville, but at the same time, not everything with a number one or number two is recyclable either. So forget the numbers, throw them out the window and keep it simple. Yes, the numbers do have a meaning. They refer to what type of plastic resin that product was made from. So I like to think of it like wood. You might have oak or bamboo or teak. They all have different qualities that make them good for different uses. And it's the same with different types of plastic. But that has nothing to do with whether or not you put it in the recycling bin or the trash bin. So forget the numbers, stick to bottles, jars, and jugs, and keep it simple. That is the program. So why? Why is it that only bottles, jars, and jugs are recyclable? And if I could say it in one sentence, it's recycling isn't magic. It's just part of our economy. So we're going to break that down. Recycling doesn't happen because you put something in the bin. For something to be recyclable, it has to be a raw material that manufacturers down the line are buying and using to make valuable new goods and products. So that item has to make it through a process to get it from your bin back onto the shelf. It has to be able to be collected. It must be able to be sorted and bailed. There must be a recycler that has the right equipment to turn those plastic items into plastic pellets. And there must be manufacturers that can use those pellets to make their products. And all along this process, there are points that impact what we can and cannot recycle here in Nashville. So we are going to go through this step by step. First off, where does Metro come in? We are the collection program. We provide the curbside and drop off collection. So we're able to collect your plastics. Um, our role is to provide the access for residents to recycle and collect the material for recycling. So we actually go and pick it up and then take it on to the next step. That's our entire role. After we collect the material, that's the point when it has to be sorted and bailed into the commodities that recyclers are willing to buy. So we contract this process out with a company called Waste Management and pay them to sort through our recycling at their facility and find buyers for that material. Um, now, as a side note, this contract that we have set up, this is just our current contract um, to figure out this part of the process. But I wanna mention that not every recycling program will be set up the same way. Um, so even regionally, recycling programs are gonna vary based on what budget the program has available for that collection. Um, and what sorting facilities are available. Franklin's gonna be different from Murfreesboro, which may be different from Clarksville. It just depends on how this part of the process has been set up. And there are a lot of ways that this can be set up. But this is how we're doing it in Nashville right now. And this is waste management sorting facility where, where our recycling goes after it's been collected. This facility and other facilities like it are specifically designed to sort recyclable materials. Um, they're called material recovery facilities, or I love to say it, MRFs, um, but they have a special set of equipment to sort out the different materials we accept in our recycling program. But what they're not designed for is to sort our recycling out from our trash. Trash and material that's not accepted in our program that ends up in the system is not only recycled, not recycled, it is still sent to, okay, going back. It is not only not recycled and still sent to landfill, it also breaks the equipment and can gum up the entire system. So that 46% is what I'm talking about, that 46% of material that should not be in this program in the bin. Um, so things like garden hoses, bulky plastics, they can't even make it through the very first step of this process. Um, at that very beginning, we start to have issues. There's a piece of equipment called the drum feeder, and it basically just is used to shake out all of the recycling so it's evenly distributed on the sorting line um, so it can be easier to sort through. Um, and things like garden hoses, chains, heavy and bulky objects that can't like laundry baskets, 
um, that can't make it through that piece of equipment. They get stuck and they can potentially break it. So you have to shut everything down. You have to pull that material out by hand. You have to make repairs or worst case scenario, replace that entire equipment, costing time and money. Um, plastic bags and bagged recyclables are also another one. They might make it through the drum feeder, through that first piece of equipment, but through the rest of the process, they will wrap around the wheels and the turning discs that are used to keep the process moving and that sort out other materials. Like what's pictured here is a cardboard screen. It's not the one at our facility, but it looks pretty similar. Um, and this kind of wrapping of that material around these uh, wheels happens daily. It happens constantly. They're constantly having to deal with this. Um, and when this happens again, you have to shut the equipment down and you have to cut it out by hand. Um, and both of these issues are issues that are happening on a daily basis. Now, so those are things that might break the equipment, might damage the equipment, but what about the actual thing, the plastics that are acceptable that go through our program um, and that sorting process? Well, that sorting process for plastics is mostly done by hand. So which, as you can imagine, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, there is not time to check for numbers. So staff is pulling out types of containers they know can be sold, bottles, jars, and jugs, and putting them into different piles. Now, waste management did invest in a new piece of technology that was installed last year. It uses a digital eye. That's what's pictured here. It uses a digital eye and an airstream to sort out one particular type of plastic, making this process a little more efficient. And it also reduces some of the human error that goes into sorting by hand. However, I will say it, it is able to pull out number one PET plastic. But as we will learn, not all number one PET plastic is recyclable. Um, so there is still going to be some error in that as well um, because of that. So this is a really cool machine. And we have a, a video later on that's going to show how these work. It's going to be pretty cool to look at. All right. So next step, if it can be sorted, if it can make it through that process, then it's ready to be shipped on to recyclers. So before new products can be made, the bales of recyclable plastic have to be processed into a product that's actually usable by manufacturers to make their goods. Um, so that's where our recyclers come in. They do the work of, they have to chip up the plastic containers, they melt it down, and then they turn it into these plastic pellets. Um, and waste management is the one that's responsible for re finding those recyclers that are gonna buy this material to be able to turn it into pellets. Now, luckily we have a really robust recycling industry here in the Southeast. This map shows all of the recyclers that bale, uh, that buy bales of plastic recyclables and all of the companies that also buy the recycled plastic pellets for use in making their products. So there are a lot of options. Uh, KW Plastics that's shown here is a company that we know a lot of our material is sold to. They buy bales of number two HDPE plastic and they turn it into HDPE pellet. Um, but they don't necessarily recycle every type of plastic. Each one of these recyclers is going to have different types of plastic that they specialize in recycling. So we have to find a recycler that is recycling the types of plastic that we have. However, uh, as I alluded to, not all materials are made the same, even if they're made from the same type of plastic. A plastic bottle and a plastic produce container, so the things you put your strawberries in, your tomatoes in, they're both made from number one PET plastic, but they're made differently with different chemical additives. So they need different equipment to be able to chip them up and recycle them. So that is why you might be able to recycle both of these items in California. They have recyclers there that can process this equipment or have the equipment to process this material, but we don't have recyclers in the Southeast with the right kind of equipment to recycle that produce container. So we can only accept number one plastic bottles. We can't accept number one plastic produce containers. Now, once the plastic is turned into pellets, we get ourselves to the back end of this process. We are closing the loop and what was once your bottle of soda is being sold to a manufacturer that will make that recycled plastic into carpet, clothing and other goods. And as a manufacturer, you are looking at two main questions. So can I use this product? Uh, can I use this to make my product? And does it make sense financially to use this product, to use these pellets? So, because plastic degrades when it is recycled, it can't be used for as many goods and products as brand new plastic. Manufacturers have to look at the characteristics of recycled plastics, such as the strength or resistance to heat, and ask, can they use it to make their product? So can I use this to make car 
carpet? Can I use it to make fleece clothing? Can I use it to make plastic lumber? Uh, and color is one of the biggest qualifiers of whether a manufacturer can use a recycled plastic versus a new plastic. Um, my favorite example, but or perhaps my most frustrating example is Tide or even Sprite. So the signature orange of a Tide detergent container when recycled with other containers of the same type of plastic, so number two HDPE plastic, it turns into a recycled plastic pellet that's colored gray or colored black. And so if you've got a gray or black pellet, that's a lot harder to color. So Tide cannot then make their signature orange from the pellets that their bottle created. So even though they created that container, that recyclable container, they're not gonna buy back the recycled plastic that that container produced. So you have to have a manufacturer that can make the material work for their products, this recycled material actually work for their products. And it's not as versatile as new plastic. Additionally, recycled plastic not only has to compete with that versatility of new plastic, it also has to compete with the price. And unfortunately, new plastic is cheaper than recycled, especially right now. Um, and so since there's not any policy, there's nothing out there that says a company has to use a certain amount of recycled content. They can make any choice that they want in the products and the packaging that they make. Um, and so, which is not the same for a lot of other, for other countries out there. And so the market for this material comes more from manufacturers and from companies that actually have a commitment to sustainability, that want to use that recycled product or have found a way to make this financially make sense for them when, uh, when the price of new plastic is so much cheaper. And again, so we do have a lot of plastics recycling going on here in the Southeast. So there are people doing this, there are people recycling plastic and using that plastic. Um, and a great example is a company called Mohawk. Um, they make all kinds of interior finishes, including carpet. And a lot of our plastic bottles go to Mohawk to become carpet. So I have a quick video that basically sums up this entire process um, that shows you how your plastic bottles will become Mohawk carpet. So we'll jump into our video. I think. Here we go. It's playing. We're good. Oh. All right. So I love that video because it really just shows that how this process can work. 
um, as well as what your plastic bottles are actually getting turned into is carpet. Um, so from collection to sorting and bailing to processing into pellets to selling that plastic to manufacturers, this entire process and what is available to us here in Nashville to fit into this process is how we get to bottles, jars, and jugs. These are the three commodities that have a strong market for manufacturing into new products here in the Southeast and across the country. These have a strong, very, very strong market here in the United States. Um, and we have recyclers here with the equipment in the Southeast to process this material. And they have the ability, um, so we have the strong market for the manufacturers to make it into new products. We have the right recyclers and we have the ability to collect that material and sort that material. So that is how we get to bottles, jars, and jugs. Okay, so wait a minute, let's back the train up here a little bit because we used to accept more than bottles, jars, and jugs. So what's happened? How has this whole market changed? Um, again, if I could do it in one sentence, selling recyclable material is not the same as recycling it. So first off, uh, I have to say for these next couple of slides, I'm only going to touch on this a little bit because we are going to talk a little bit more um, or really take a deep dive into big plastic and the economics of recycling with our local experts in our next section. Um, but in brief, since the 1970s, the plastic industry has been marketing all plastics as recyclable. That's where we get those very frustrating, confusing numbers from. That's where those symbols were created from the plastics industry to make you feel like everything is recyclable. And plastic producers have always and still want you to believe that all plastic is recyclable, but it's not for all the reasons that we just talked about and more. Um, however, their marketing efforts have resulted in recycling programs across the country, including here in Nashville, preaching quantity over quality. So throw it in the bin, participate in recycling. It's easy, throw it all in there, we'll figure out how to recycle it. So it put the responsibility of recycling on you, the consumer, while also making you believe that all the material that you were throwing in was actually getting recycled. So throw that notion out the door. Not everything can be recycled. Well, at the same time as that's going on, you also have China. And China is buying up a lot of the United States plastic recyclables, 33.4%. So that meant that there was a high demand for plastic material. China couldn't get enough of it. And so the demand here locally was also high for that material and trying to get their hands on that material. So even though here in the Southeast, here in Nashville, we're not necessarily shipping our plastic to China, um, our stuff stays here in the Southeast. But the high demand meant that the recyclers in our region here locally they're willing to pay more money for less quality material. So there can be more non-recyclable material in that bale of plastic that we're selling and they're still willing to pay high prices for it. Um, so they go in and they pick out those different materials they can't recycle and still send it to landfill and take what they can actually recycle and keep that. So we're essentially able to sell non-recyclable plastic trash with a recyclable material. So even though we were able to sell, even though we were able to accept it, we collected it, it was able to be sorted and was able to be sold, it was never able to actually be recycled. So in 2018, China effectively banned the import of recovered plastic and they stopped buying all that recyclable or rather non-recyclable plastic from the United States. So now recyclers here in the US, um, there's no longer all that competition that came with the high demand that China created. So there's an excess material that's available across the country and recyclers, even here in the Southeast, now they're like, ah, I don't have to compete anymore. I can now pay less for that material because there's so much of it. And I also can require that it's a much higher quality product. I don't wanna be picking out all of that non-recyclable material anymore and dealing with sending it to landfill. I only want the product I can use. So we basically just can't sell our trash without recycling anymore. Um, so our recycling, it wasn't ever being recycled, it was just being sold. And there's a big difference there. So I'm often asked, why can't we recycle more? Why can't we recycle this? Well, what about this? How do I recycle this other plastic thing that's not a bottle, jar, or jug? Well, I'd like to challenge you to ask yourself a different question. How can we think differently? 
How can we think upstream to find solutions that prevent all of this waste in the first place? If we don't create it, we don't have to figure out how to get rid of it. So how can we rethink? How can we redesign? How can we reduce? And how can we reuse before thinking about how we can recycling, how we can recycle it? Because recycling is really just one step above landfilling. So, well, because this problem also, it, this problem is not going away, which is why we need to look at these other solutions. We are making more and more plastic. Um, and this trend is expected to continue at least to 2050, with the majority of all of these new products being made single use, hard to recycle packaging. So a lot of packaging that we don't need. Um, but I do want to point out that our recycling system, because we haven't been investing it in it because it's all been going to China, there are some changes that we can make. Um, and there are changes that should be made to improve our recycling because we can recycle more. There can be more markets for some of this material. Not all of it, certainly not all of it, um, but there are some other um, opportunities for recycling and recycling is still part of the solution. Um, so we need to make these improvements but it's only a small part of that can really be led by individual action. There are so many other factors that are at play that require big change to be able to effectively recycle more. It requires enacting new policies, making producers responsible for the waste um, their packaging and their products create. It requires bigger investment in recycling infrastructure. It requires building market demand for that used recyclable material and more consistency across the country in what can and cannot be recycled. So there's a lot of work both here locally as well as nationally that has to happen to really increase our recycling um, here locally and across the country. Um, but ultimately, even with all of that change, please remember that recycling is not the solution to dealing with all of the plastic waste that we are creating. There's so much more that we need to be doing upstream from recycling. And because less than 10% of plastic is actually getting recycled. Um, and if you read any of the quotes that were from that brainwashing uh, slide that I had shared, even the industry, uh, the plastics industry in the 1970s and even today um, have admitted that recycling is really not the answer. They want you to believe it's the answer, but they know that it's not economically feasible to be able to solve this problem. Um, so we need to look at a more holistic approach. So when it comes to recycling, for you as an individual, focus on quality over quantity. Only put in your recycling the materials that can actually be recycled, the materials that have a strong market. Uh, and we know that plastic bottles, plastic jars, and plastic jugs, these are things that have a strong market um, here in the Southeast. These actually have a strong market pretty much all across the country. Um, it's when you start getting into some of those stranger plastics, those new plastics that are being made, those are the ones that are starting to require that new equipment and new technology. So focus on these things, bottles, jars, and jugs. These are the things we can sell. These are the things that are valuable in creating new goods and products. So if it doesn't have a neck, it doesn't have a cap, leave it out of your bin. And for everything else, um, I look to the great architect, Mies van der Rohe, um, because less is more. That is one of the things he always said is less is more. And the best thing you can do to fix this problem is, again, not to create that waste in the first place. So we need to start thinking, again, at the top of this uh, hierarchy, at the top of this pyramid. Um, as an individual, you can make some changes. So think about um, buying less, getting less, refuse what you don't need, and reuse or repair items when you can say no to unnecessary plastic, especially right now when, you know, I'm still not necessarily going out to restaurants or anything, you know, I'm still getting takeout. And when you get takeout, you end up with all this unnecessary plastic. So how can you ask for less? How can you say, no, I don't need those plastic utensils. I don't need the straws. I don't need the extra ketchup packets because I've got all that stuff at home. So find ways you can say no to unnecessary plastic. Um, and I will also say with plastic bags right now that has come up a lot is, is it safe to use those single use or to use a reusable bag? Um, and a lot of health experts have come out and said, yes, absolutely. It is safe to use a reusable bag. Um, so, you know, if you can do that, look to using those reusable bags instead of those single use plastic bags. And when you do buy items, see if you can buy things that are used, things that are recycled, have recycled content in them. 
Um, that helps the whole system work better if you're buying things for recycling, if you're buying things that are recycled. Um, and then buy more local and buy from companies that also share your values for sustainability. Use that power of purchase to make change. Um, and then when all else fails again, I have to say it over and over again, only recycle bottles, jars, and jugs and leave everything else out. Now, there is only so much we can do as individuals, as I've said, and we have to ask for that bigger change from the top. So what you can do as an individual um, to that is to stay educated on the issues. Vote for leaders that reflect your values. There is actually a lot of federal legislation on the table right now. In fact, there's one piece of legislation, the Save Our Seas Act, that was just signed um, into law, which is going to be a, a really great piece of legislation for plastic waste. Um, especially in terms of the, the plastic pollution in our oceans. Um, but there's a lot more out there. There's a lot more on the table, the Recycle Act, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And these are all things that ask for, they aim to reduce our plastic waste, to increase our recycling infrastructure and make producers more responsible for the end life of their products, have better labeling. Um, and you know, there, there's just a lot that those um, pieces of legislation can do. And so by, again, staying educated on those issues, voting for those leaders, and then also advocating for that legislation to your um, contacting your senators, contacting your representatives and letting them know that you want to see that move forward um, is a way that we can all work together to, to do more to improve recycling while also um, reducing our plastic waste. And I will say, I pulled a lot of this last little bit from Urban Green Lab and Patrick's fabulous blog post that goes into all of this and a whole lot more. Um, I think he's gonna drop a link in the chat to uh, awesome, it's already there. Mm -hmm. So I know I ran through this really fast uh, and it's a lot of information to, um, to chew on and to think about. And I'll be honest, I probably could have spent 30 minutes on every single slide, uh, but I didn't want to do that to all of you. So I am at the end of the presentation, but I know if you have questions, I'm happy to answer more questions. I will say that um, from Public Works, not part of this series, but just part of the regular um, programming that Public Works has, we do have a Recycling 101 workshop that goes into all of our materials. This focused on plastic um, because we have so many questions about plastic specifically. I wanted to kind of take a deeper dive into it through this program. But if you wanna know more, if you wanna actually see our um, process, uh, sorting process in action, we do have a video um, that's part of that workshop, but then also fingers crossed, if we can get past COVID, we will eventually get people back and touring the actual facility um, or rather visiting the actual facility. So we can't, for safety reasons, you can't go near the equipment, but we do have a window and you can see and actually get to kind of see where this all um, takes place. So we do have those other um, opportunities um, available as well. Awesome, Jen, thank you so much for that. Uh, and we do have a bunch of questions. I am got sure. About, we got about 20 minutes left, so I'm actually hopeful that we're gonna be able to get through all of those. So uh, if you have any more questions, keep those coming in through the chat and we'll just take them as they come in and up first. Um, we received several questions also, and a big thank you to everyone who submitted questions when they yes. registered. Uh, but we received several questions um, through the registration about some hard to recycle items. Um, does Metro Nashville Public Works have any resources and more information for residents on what they can do with things like film, foam, and electronics? That is a really good question. So um, because of the way our sorting process works, there are a few items out there that can be recycled. They just have to be collected in a different way. Um, they need to be collected separately. So film plastics, we don't offer a program for film like those single-use plastic bags. Um, you can take those to a... Um, to Kroger or to a big box store, they will have those. Um, I will say, um, just like our system, if things are too contaminated, sometimes a good recyclable ends up in the landfill anyway, because it's been um, destroyed by food or residue or things like that. So um, I will say, look for a bin that doesn't look like it's also been used as a trash bin. Um, but those, there are those programs out there and they are able to recycle those through a different method and through their collection programs. Um, for styrofoam, 
I do firmly believe that styrofoam is evil and you should stay away mm. from styrofoam. It never goes away. You should try not to get it. Um, but I know sometimes it's avoidable um, or not, not avoidable. So if you do get styrofoam, if you have like cups or um, contain, like uh, takeout containers that are clean um, and you can take those to Publix, they have a foam recycling um, program. But if you're talking things like packaging foam, there's a place out in Laverne, if you want to collect all of that or get with some of your friends to collect all of it and take some trips out, um, that there is a place out in Laverne that offers that. And I can pull, um, that's on our website, I believe, at recycle.nashville.gov. Uh, and we can make sure that we have those links available for you. Um, and then for other things, Metro Nashville, we do offer some other recycling programs. Um, with plastic specifically, electronic items are things that are not allowed by law in your trash can or your recycling cart. You cannot throw away electronics um, because they are hazardous. And so we have an electronics recycling program. So you can take all kinds of electronics to our household um, or our, excuse me, to our convenience centers where we collect electronics. Um, so there are some other, we also do, um, we do mattress recycling and some tire recycling and things like that as well. So there's some other programs that our convenience centers have. Um, but beyond that, um, a lot of those other programs, there's some miscellaneous programs out there where you can drop things off. Um, but again, I will say, look to those higher options. How can you not get those? How can you not get those film plastics as opposed to figuring out where you can recycle them? All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have, uh, why isn't Nashville investing in equipment that can handle additional types of plastic recycling, including incinerators? Oh, that, that is also a good question. Um, so for us to invest in equipment, um, you just saw that whole complicated process that it really has to be if, if there is a manufacturer out there that is using that plastic to make new goods and products, then that gives reason for a processor or recycler to exist to process that material, which then gives there to be a reason for there to be equipment to sort and collect that material. So for us to make the investment, there we have to have somewhere for that plastic to go. Um, so if there's not a market, there's really not a reason to invest in that equipment. Now, I will say there, um, we do work Again, we also work with a contract. So that is up to waste management. We don't own a materials recycling facility. So it's really up to waste management to decide whether or not they're going to invest in new equipment to handle this additional type of plastic. Um, number five plastic is a great example. There are some grants out there right now through the recycling partnership and some other nonprofits to install some equipment to help that sorting process. However, they also have to be able to sell that material and in our conversations with them, they don't necessarily have the ability to sell that material. They actually don't get a lot of it. Number five plastic. I mean, if you're only getting a couple of pieces here and a couple of pieces here, that just doesn't make sense financially either. Um, but it's not that we are not um, investing in equipment. We are looking at all the options that are available to us and figuring out um, a strategy that makes sense to improve our recycling here. When that contract comes up, we will absolutely be looking for ways that we can, how, is there any possibilities to include other plastics in our program um, through the means that are available to us? Um, with incinerators, I will say incinerators, that strategy falls below recycling and above landfilling in terms of sustainability um, and what that environmentally preferred strategy. So we really are trying to look above that. Um, what can we do on the higher end of that hierarchy before we go into something like incineration? And incineration also, if for any of you that are on this webinar that um, lived in Nashville far before I did, and we used to have a waste incinerator here in Nashville, a waste to energy facility, it caused a lot of pollution, air pollution, noise pollution. Um, so it's definitely something that is alluded to in our zero waste master plan. Are there waste to energy options that are available, but they get evaluated along with everything else. Um, so I do encourage you if you, you've got questions about our zero waste master plan, zerowaste.nashville.gov. We have a lot of strategies that we have laid out um, to get us to more recycling, less waste with the goal of reducing our waste by 90%. So you'll find more information um, about that there as well. 
All right, next up we have, uh, how can we push, how can we push industries in the public toward compostable containers? Ooh, so this is a really interesting uh, question because um, I wonder, there's not a lot there on that question. And I wonder um, if this is considering the idea that compostable might break down in a landfill. Um, so for something to be, okay. So if we have a compostable container, just like recycling, to manage a compostable container, you have to have a facility that composts. We have to have the ability to um, collect that material and send it to a compost facility. Compostable containers do not break down a landfill. They just stay the same container. They, it does not, there's not the oxygen in there. It's a whole different scientific process. Um, and so there's kind of this misunderstanding that if it's biodegradable or if it's compostable, that it's going to be fine if you throw in a landfill, but it's not, it's still going to create methane gas as it sits there and does nothing in the landfill because it doesn't really break down. It just creates methane gas. So um, to push towards compostable containers, we first need to have that infrastructure set in place. And it is part of Nashville's zero waste master plan to include uh, organics, collection. So that includes, you know, having food waste collection and compost collection um, and provide that to residents. Right now we do have our drop-off locations to collect compostable materials. So if you have compostable containers, we absolutely want to see more compostable containers over these plastic items that there is no home for them. But we just have to make sure that there's also the infrastructure that can manage that. Because if all of a sudden, if we were to put in policy that said, okay, everybody, every has to use this type of container has to be a compostable container which also by state law we i don't think we can actually do that um then we have all this material and there's only one facility the compost company um right now set up to even take that material so we work with them closely and we have lots of conversations with them and with others to make sure that when we do move more towards that that we're able to support that and actually have somewhere for that material to go awesome um, let's see, next question we have here and keep the questions coming. I'm answering some of them in the chat and sending the other ones off to Jen. Um, do large retail chains really recycle the plastic bags that consumer returns to the drop-off bins? Uh, that is a, it's a question we get a lot and I'll be honest, um, I can't say that I really know. I don't work for those companies. Um, what I do know is that if the container is being used as a trash can, that material is not recyclable anymore. It's not clean. So they're not able to recycle the material that is contaminated, um, that has all that food residue all over it. But if it is clean and if it is just plastic bags, just plastic film, that absolutely can be sent off and sold and recycled. Uh, and I actually have a little bit of insight on this uh, as well. Uh, I actually reached out to Kroger several months ago to see what they did with those plastic bags and was told that it is proprietary and not something that they share with members of the public. So uh, your guess is as good as mine as what happens there. But always a better move is instead of focusing on recycling plastic bags is making sure you have your own reusable bags when you go to Kroger. Yeah. Um, and so this one comes from Councilperson uh, Berkeley Allen. Um, uh, are plastic bottle caps actually recycled? Most are not PET or HDPE, so they, so they aren't actually, so they aren't actually thrown away in the processor, at the processor, excuse me. So this is another, it, it's not a, it's a question that I have as well, but I'm not exactly sure I haven't found the right person to ask because it, it is also going to depend on the processor. So most plastic caps are number five plastic. This I don't want to get too far into it, but it is a potential commodity that there are um, there are people that accept that plastic more so than three, four, six, seven. Um, so the way that the processing works is that when all the bottles are chipped up and it gets washed, the density, I guess, of the different types of plastic are different so that when the material is washed, they're able to separate out. So I can't remember which one floats and which one sinks, but the number one PET, I think sinks, and the number five um, polypropylene floats. So when sinks, when floats, they're able to split them apart. But it does mean that you have an entire clean stream, a clean bale of number five plastic. So if they're able to process that, 
and sell it, they will. I would, I can't see why they wouldn't do that. So um, my guess is that it does actually get recycled, but they're not necessarily pulling from, they don't necessarily want our dirty bales of number five polypropylene plastic. Um, but I can't say that for sure. I haven't talked to a processor about, haven't had a chance to talk to a processor about it, um, but there is potential for recyclability there. So the industry standard is to keep the cap on for that potential. So I say, keep the cap on um, because they have designed the process for that cap to be on. I hope that right. answers it enough. <laughs> I think so. Um, this next one comes from McKinsey. Uh, is the process of chipping up the plastic and turning it into pellets bad for the environment with gases emitted or something? Um, well, I will say yes and no. Um, so I don't, depending on the, pro all processes are different. Um, I know here in the United States, they have to meet regulation um, for all of that. So whatever that process that's going on here in the United States, it's going to meet those regulations. Um, and so, but when you look at this process going on in other countries that don't have this kind of regulation, that melting process is absolutely toxic. So we are regulating that and mitigating that here, whereas, but um, I don't know to, beyond that, I don't exactly know all the details, but it is something that's regulated. All right, uh, next up, we have an item from Steve. Uh, oh, well, I'm sorry, it was actually just covered. Uh, is it necessary to keep the cap on plastic bottles, jars, and jugs? Um, this next one is also from McKinsey. Uh, do you know if recycled plastic can be used for food or pet containers? Uh, does the FDA prohibit it for food quality concerns? And again, that's from McKinsey. So every plastic is made differently and recycled plastic also degrades. So that's why I didn't go really deep down into the, um, there was a sheet that I had shared. Actually, maybe I can pop back to it really quick. Um, but there is, boop, boop, boop. It's not too far back. Come on, get back there. Here it is. So um, this sheet, you can see here, there are all these different aspects of all these different types of plastic, um, depending on what type of plastic is, um, you know, what, you know, whether it's HG number one, number two, number four, whatever it is. And then at their processing also determines a lot of other um, parts of this process. So I don't know specifically what recycled plastic might be good for what and what recycled plastic might be good for something else. Um, but I do know that the people that are using that product, using that recycled product, they're making sure that it meets the standards and, and regulations, whether federal or state regulations, um, for whatever product that they're going to be making. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities out there, but I, so I can't answer it specifically, um, but hopefully that gives you a better idea of, of how that process works. If that makes sense. All right. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, again, this one is from Councilperson uh, Berkeley Allen. Uh, where are other parts of the country recycling clamshells? What are they turning them into and how do we attract these processors and manufacturers here? That is an excellent question. Um, so there are, as far as I know, there's about a handful of processors. There's a couple, I believe in California and a couple, I believe in Mexico. Um, so they are um, servicing pretty much California and some other areas. Um, so there's not many of them. Um, additionally, so how we attract those folks here, one of the reasons why that's available in California is because California is so close to their zero waste goal um, because of their, and they have policy and they have legislation that's been enacted that bans certain things, that requires certain things of their products that are sold, the material that's recycled there. So they just have a lot of policy and legislation that pushes um, there to be a manufacturer that would take that material. Um, so those requirements are things that are also included in our, our zero waste master plan um, long term to think about how we can do some bans. But there also just has to be from the top level, from that federal level, um, to get more of those folks that are investing in that material and investing in chipping it down. Um, so basically, the difference is that 
that um, plastic produce container, it chip, when you try to chip it down, it turns into really, really fine fibers, like plastic little fi fibers that are just really hard to manage um, is my understanding. So I don't know, I, I'd imagine that the, the PET that comes out of it is probably the same PET that can be used for anything else that's made from PET, carpet, fleece clothing, all those same types of products. Um, it's just really trying to manage that material. Um, but also if we start, I think looking at this also from the perspective of if we're starting to figure out, well, how do we recycle this material? How do we recycle this material? How do we pull this manufacturer here? Plastic, there's no regulation on how people make their plastic packaging here in the United States. So there are so many different variations and so many different types, even within that one through seven, that if, trying to find more manufacturers to, manuf to manage all this material, um, just it's almost never ending. So if we can find a way to move upstream again, and then this is something that really goes above Nashville, above the state and up to the federal level um, to find solutions where we're not making packaging that requires new manufacturers. Why can't we make a package that already fits the system that we have? And that's more, um, at least personally, I think what, what we should be looking at. Um, but there is some material, yes, if we can enact some policy and enact some legislation that will um, start to drive more um, of that manufacturing and recyclers here to our region. All right, um, this next one comes from Jeremy and it's uh, not necessarily directed at you, Jen, but uh, if we could kind of maybe crowdsource this answer for him, that would be beautiful. Uh, but he's looking for any suggestions for daily contact where who has PP05 disposable contacts. Uh, essentially, I'm contributing 730 pieces of plastic annually. annually. Uh, these are small, but certainly annoying. Uh, so if anybody has any suggestions, feel free to put those in the chat. And uh, Jen, if you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear. I actually do. Um, if you want to email me, um, so there's a program called the Tennessee Materials Marketplace. Um, it's a really cool program that has been supported by the state. Um, and we're very fortunate to have it here in Nashville that is basically a, it's an online marketplace platform for businesses, for business waste. So weird stuff that your business ends up with. Um, and ways that that material can either be um, reused or recycled. So it allows different businesses in the entire region or even across the country to uh, make connections on, to be able to sell or recycle some of their weird, hard to recycle stuff that they're making a lot of. Um, so that is a program that you do have to be invited to or request an invitation. Uh, and we at uh, Public Works, one of my colleagues actually works specifically with that program more for construction demolition waste, but it's not just construction demolition, it's all types of business recycling. And it sounds like maybe that's what's happening here is that it's a waste from a, a business activity or a manufacturing activity. Um, so if that's the case, I'd love to get you hooked up to the materials marketplace. If you just wanna shoot me an email, we can do that. Excellent. And uh, the email's right there, Jen Harmon, Jen .harmon at nashville.gov. Uh, this next one comes from Heidi. Uh, oh, is there any movement in Nashville slash Tennessee to ban plastic bags? Uh, any bills coming up to vote on banning plastic bags? I know the answer to this one and Heidi is no fun because our state actually has a ban on plastic bag bans and I'm sure Jen could talk more about that. Yes, so the state, um, they have two big plastic bans and that's a ban on plastic bags. And also uh, you, you cannot ban, you have a ban on banning plastic bags, and you have a ban on banning containers, like takeout containers and stuff like that. However, and that's locally, you can't do it. However, the state can. So the state can enact legislation. And that's what they've said for the plastic bags is that they said, well, they didn't want it to be different across the state. They wanted it to be consistent across the state. And so, and they actually have part, uh, I know Kroger was involved with this pre-COVID. There was legislation that had been brought to the state um, to the state um, uh, legislature, and it had been reviewed a little bit, but then COVID. Um, and the last I looked, it was still kind of hanging in there, just kind of, it still lived there. It hadn't necessarily died, um, but I don't know that anybody's making any movement on it at this point anymore. Across the country, because of COVID and because Again, there's been a lot of marketing from the plastics industry to say that plastic, um, that reusable bags are not safe. Um, 
And that so there's been a lot of pushback and a lot of research that has gone in to say, no, um, reusable bags are safe. You don't need to be using those single use plastic bags. But because of that, it's really stalled a lot of these um, bag ban programs across the country. You're starting to see them come back though, which is fabulous. Um, so uh, I think Mexico City actually just had one. I know that's out of the United States. It's just always shocking to me when these other places are ahead of us. Um, so, so it's possible, but it would be worth maybe reaching out to your representative or your, um, your state representatives and asking them, hey, where is this? Is this moving forward? We want to see this move forward. Because Kroger was actually supportive of it because it is part of their um, uh, zero waste, zero hunger goals as well their sustainability goals. All right. Um, and we are at one. Uh, if you are interested and in, uh, able to stay on the line while we get through these other questions, uh, we really do appreciate that. And I'm sure you would as well. Um, but if you do have to go as it is lunch in the middle of the workday, I encourage everyone uh, to register for our next session. It's Big Plastic and the Economics of Recycling. It's going to be on January 27th via Zoom at noon. Uh, and you can register the, for that by going to Urban Green Lab's website, Metro Nashville Public Works website. Uh, be sure to like all of us on social media. You can find us at Urban Green Lab just about everywhere. Uh, and you can find uh, the Zero Waste Nashville page on Facebook. All right, and getting right back to those questions. Um, recycling in my county is no longer available. Is there an accessible drop-off location in Nashville for non-Nashville recyclers? Uh, I know there's been a couple of, uh, unfortunately, regional programs that have um, reduced their recycling or completely quit the recycling programs, um, unfortunately. So Nashville's recycling drop-off locations are, they are for residents um, only. If you are working here in Nashville, though, um, a drop-off location, I probably shouldn't say this, they're not monitored by staff convenience centers are but they are specifically meant for residents but if you do work here in nashville and you don't have access i'm not going to tell you don't go to that recycling drop-off site maybe i should but um so it is specifically for residents but there are some drop-off locations that you could take some material to um here in nashville all right uh yeah we're not uh we're not looking so feel free to recycle <laughs> as long as you recycle correctly um, but I will the, say that's just the traditional recycler. So the convenience mm -hmm. centers, those are for residents only. So there's not the access to the mattress recycling and the electronics recycling and that kind of stuff. That is, that is for residents. Excellent. Uh, this next one comes from Ashlyn. Uh, is there any movement in Nashville slash, oh wait, no. Um, I've already read that one. This next one comes from McKinsey again. Uh, is there any movement in Nah, oh, sorry, I actually already asked that one. It looks like it was asked twice. Um, are you familiar with the recycling program used by Dollywood? I realize that it's a different market area, but definitely work, worth looking at. And that comes from Phyllis. I actually have no clue about Dollywood's recycling, but I'm definitely gonna look into it. All right, uh, we got about three more here. How does Nashville compare with other cities in terms of accepting a broader array, array of recycling? And that comes from Dana. Sorry, say that again. My thing kind of paused. Sorry about that. Uh, how does Nashville compare with other cities in terms of accepting a broader array of recycling? Um, so that's, again, that kind of goes back to um, how their program is set up. So all of those different steps along that process can mean a lot of different programs are gonna exist. Our goal here in Nashville, this is the number one goal for me and for our program, is that everything you throw in the bin is recyclable. We're not gonna tell you that something, it's why we've restricted some of our materials because we know they're not being recycled. Um, you know, those plastic tubs, actually by contract, that doesn't necessarily, it's not getting recycled, but we can technically accept those as part of our contract. But I'm not gonna tell you to put that tub in there because that tub's not gonna get recycled. It's still gonna go to a landfill. Um, so because of those weird subtleties and, um, just depending on what collection program someone has, someone may only, for example, collect, um, drop-off locations. They may not have curbside programs or they may have more robust curbside programs. So we don't accept glass curbside because 
the way the sorting facility is, they can't accept it there and it has to be sorted separately. So it really is dependent upon the equipment that's available. It's dependent upon the contract that is made and the agreements that are made. Um, and then again, what can actually be recycled in the region. Um, so I will say that for our region and for a mu municipal program, so keep in mind, we're also, we're taking stuff from residents. We're not commercial recycling. So commercial recyclers might have more availability because they have a whole lot of just one thing. They're not having to deal with picking out the trash. So I will say that for our region, I believe that we are recycling as much as we possibly can. So other programs that might accept more materials, I am personally skeptical as to whether or not they're actually able to have a market for that. Um, and if they actually do, I want to talk to them and figure out how they've made that happen. Um, so I think in terms of what's actually being recycled, our program is pretty robust. There are programs that are going to, you know, in the Southeast that are going to accept more. And certainly when you start looking further across the country, there are other programs that accept a whole lot more. They're able to make that work, um, that, and actually have even bulky plastics be able to be recyclable. But for our region, I think we're very robust in, in what we're able to accept. All right. Uh, and if you have any more questions, please keep them coming in. Um, uh, for many of us, uh, having groceries delivered during the pandemic, um, mm. and it seems many of us are still having groceries delivered during the pandemic, and it seems as if plastic bags are the default. Do you have any suggestions? And that comes from F. Clark. Ooh. Um, something I've actually not thought about, uh, and perhaps worth thinking a little bit more about. Um, I. I don't see that they're going to package it in any other way. Um, that's a, a good question. I don't know, Patrick, if you have any thoughts on it. I I don't. I will say, put your public put your health first before mm -hmm. your choice between a reusable and a plastic single use plastic bag. Um, that absolutely always comes first. Um, but and hopefully we can get past the, the pandemic and we can get back to um, not having to worry about our health when we go to the grocery store. Uh, I totally get that. Unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer for that question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some um, attendees are saying you can possibly request paper bags. Um, that's oh. possibly something. I know you can use get paper bags at Kroger uh, if you go in person, um, but perhaps you can request uh, for paper bags. Um, for the grocery pickups and deliveries. That's a good, um, that's a good idea. And are there any more questions? Hopefully I got to all of them. I apologize if you asked a question and I was not able to get to it. Um, but if you're still on the call, uh, feel free to ask in the chat box. Uh, and this one's from Monica Souders. Nashville benefits from a secondary plastics market at QRS in St. Louis. The plastic bales travel by barge for clean for the cleaning and sorting. Thank you for the info, Monica. Uh, oh, could you? T uh, thank you, Mackenzie. I saw that question, and for whatever reason, it did not copy into my little thing. Um, but from Mackenzie, could you touch on aluminum versus plastic as it relates to recycling? Oh yeah, so probably the the choice if this oh yeah or, uh, slash yeah, or like, best containers yes. Yeah. Um, so do I get the soda can or do I get the soda bottle? Um, I always go for can mainly because mm -hmm. I like the metallic taste, but that comes from drinking it out of the can, but also keep in mind metal. So, um, metal is infinitely recyclable. That mm -hmm. metal can, uh, will be recycled over. If you put it in the container, it, in your recycling bin, it will be recycled over and over and over again. Um, it is infinite. Plastic can only be recycled a couple of times before it's just trash. There's nothing you can do with it and it's going to live forever. So once plastic gets made, it's just, it's really going to live forever. So I say go for the metal can, go for the aluminum can. Um, it also fetches a higher price as well in terms of the economics. Excellent. Uh, we got one question from Dana. What about the signs at the collection center getting much larger to better educate the folks using that center? Um, get like, what do you mean by larger? They are about three feet by three feet. Uh, I guess, um, in size, Dana, do you want to maybe elaborate a little bit more? 
I mean, I can say, so the signs that, what we tried to do- uh, She says the, not at Hillsboro. Hillsboro. Hillsboro High School? Uh, I'm assuming so, yeah. Hillsboro. Yes. So the um, recycling at Hillsboro High School, I know they have a ton of containers over there. Um, so the drop-off signs that are, th there are drop-off signs that are about three, three feet by three feet. They're the same ones we have at all of our drop-off locations. Um, they have, you know, we've just redone them to try and focus really on the pictures, um, focus on what does it look like? These are the things that go in that bin. Um, so I know one of the issues that we've had is that they do sit on the ground. Um, and we've talked internally as if there's a way, because they sit on the ground so they can easily be moved around because one container is not always going to stay, a, 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 you know, one container might take paper one day and the next day it's taking aluminum cans. So those signs have to be movable. Um, it would be better if they were not sitting on the ground. Um, and we've talked a little bit internally on how we can potentially fix that problem or find a solution there. Um, and there are some containers that actually have slots for them. So sometimes those slots will be utilized. Um, but in terms of making them bigger, we have not talked about, we just redid all of those signs to focus on those um, pictures. Um, so I don't know that there's been talk of redoing them at this time, um, but we, you know, if there's any thoughts or, you know, anything else we can do, we have just added a lot of decals on every single container now has um, huge big red signs that say do not uh, bag your recyclables and do not recycle plastic bags. So that was one thing that we're really trying to push um, at those centers because um, that's really the bigger issue that comes with those recycling is a, a lot of the issue is with a lot of bagged recyclables, a lot of plastic bags and that kind of stuff. Excellent. Thank you so but much. But I am taking that, that feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Take it back. Um, and so uh, not a question, but this one comes from Monica Souders. Uh, the carbon footprint of aluminum from raw materials is much higher than recycled, recycled aluminum as well. Could not agree more on that. Um, and that looks like it does it for questions. Again, thank you all everyone for attending our first session of Sustainable in the City, Thinking Upstream. Uh, again, I encourage you all to attend our next session, Big Plastic and the Economics of Recycling on January 27th at noon. Uh, if you have any questions for Jen or I, suggestions on new topics, weird things that you wanna learn more about, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, my email address is patrick at urbangreenlab.org uh, and Jen's is jenharman at nashville.gov. Uh, until the next time, y'all, take care and stay safe. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day.